Welcome to PhotoEye Conversations. I'm PhotoEye's gallery director, Ann Kelly, and tonight we're going to be talking to Krista about her new online exhibition. Welcome, Krista. Hello, I'm Krista Svalbonis. So tonight we're going to talk about our new online exhibition of Krista's work, which includes two different bodies of work, What Remains and Displacement. From my perspective, both of those bodies of work come from a really personal place, but are not specifically just about you, per se. It's definitely a fair a fair assessment of both of them. They stem from a personal family history, but uh, both bodies of work kind of go beyond that personal family history. A lot of your work relates to home and dislocation, and your parents were inspiration in in your interest. I'd like to go into that a bit. That would be great. The first series that I started called Displacement delved into a personal family history. And so both of my parents came to the U.S. as refugees from the Baltic countries of Latvia and Lithuania shortly after uh, World War II. So about like in the 1950s, they came over. So they lived in refugee camps in Germany for about five years their family is my family, was fleeing a Soviet occupation at the times, so the regime at that time and ended up in Germany. And then from there in the U.S. Identity is kind of a big part of the work as a result. And I, I think this kind of came for a lot of the refugees at that time period. They came to the U.S., but they really held on to the roots of the home countries that they had left. And those roots just kept getting passed down through the generations. So I, you know, I grew up bilingual. I grew up speaking, you know, both Latvian and and English. And my parents were very invested in kind of having me go to Latvian camp and kind of learn the traditions of, you know, the homeland and and sort of the folklore and and the folk tradition that kind of got passed down through generations as well. And so that was very much a part uh, of kind of keeping keeping ties to, to what they had left behind. So let's talk a little bit about the the actual prints, specifically the laser cut aspect of those prints, because that's a really interesting story. I went to Germany to document these former refugee camps that held Baltic individuals. And then in the process of you know finding where they were located, which was like a task in and of itself, it's not um, very well known where these camp spaces are. But digging through archives to find that information, I came across a large number of plea letters that the refugees were sending to the U.S., U.K., and Canada, all asking for asylum. So basically explaining they couldn't go back home. They had to, you know, find a home elsewhere. And when I did my first research trip and I came back home with all these images, and then I had these letters as well. And I kept thinking about, you know, how I could kind of combine the two. What could I do that could combine their, their text with, with, you know, my images of, of the spaces. And it just happened at that time, serendipitously, that I was learning to use a laser cutter at one of the universities I was teaching at. That just sparked like, kind of like a, just an idea, you know, is, is there a way that I could use burn text literally quite into, into the images um, of these camps. And, and that's what I started doing. It took me maybe about like a year to figure out how to do that process without sort of the image falling apart or, you know, a lighting and flame. And then, yeah. And then this work kind of came out of that. Well, just the process alone and then getting it perfectly aligned with the printed image. Yeah, it was, it was definitely a learning curve. It was something that I think it still is a, a, a bit unique to to my work, and you know, not a lot of people are kind of doing doing uh, laser laser cut work with with photographs. So yeah, it was very brand new, kind of solving these technical issues that came up as as I was making making the work. But I've gotten uh, familiar enough, you know, uh, skilled enough that the laser and I are are we we get along a little bit better these days. <laughs> I mean, it was it was a little difficult at first, but yeah, we get along now. So made made friends with the tool. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we don't have as many arguments, you know, sometimes, but not all the time. 
and then you also paint and make sculptures as well so that's that's kind of bringing the sculptural level to the photographic print though it's one dimensional the ability to um, actually see through it and it creates shadow and I wish everybody listening could see the the actual physical prints here right now because they're really special Thank you. Thanks for saying that. They are meant they are meant to be seen in person. There's a very different kind of relationship to kind of seeing them seeing them live. But I for a long time I've been exploring in my practice that started in graduate school where I kind of started thinking about the photograph and how we could manipulate the photograph and kind of combine it with other media and sort of push it into a direction that was more sculptural or dimensional or you know had some form. And so I've been and I'm continuing those roots ever since um, ever since grad school. Well, at least with the online exhibition, you can zoom into the various images and and get a better sense of the details. So, yeah, that's absolutely, a bit helpful. And you also have a video on your website, one of the actual pieces, which is helpful in getting a better sense of the detail. The image and the text are quite literally combined. Um, and so one is inseparable from the other. Um, and then, yeah, depending on how the work is lit, you get that that nice shadow um, on the back and it becomes dimensional. And the way the images are placed, they're discernible as words, but it's not as though someone could actually read it. So usually individuals can read like the top line. So that'll give them like a sensibility of kind of what the story might be. They might be able to read like Latvia, Lithuania or Estonia or World War II um, from, from the top line. And then uh, that gets people curious to kind of know a little bit more of the story. It is intentional in the fact that I left them to be a little bit more interpretable and a little bit more mysterious. And the idea sort of the, of this history va like quickly uh disappearing you know we have firsthand witnesses of this of this history um steadily not with us and so i'm kind of reflecting that as well within the work too this disappearing history you've been on this mission to record it through means of, of interviews and portraits yes that's, that's a really amazing layer as well i felt the pressure of that you know in the in the past couple years because this generation, you know, who who experienced that, they're all well in their late seventies to you know, um, early early nineties. Although I interviewed um, somebody not too long ago who was ninety eight, um, so there's a few a very a few people that that uh, in those numbers left. But yeah, that's that has been a, a mission in the past couple years, um, and I've interviewed. I've finally completed. I think. A good amount of interviews uh and that's tallied up to 100 people so that's, that's impressive now it's the task of kind of taking all of those interviews and um and digitizing them you know getting them into into a uh, method that can be printable do you think you would ever use words from those interviews and laser cut them into new images you might make i haven't thought about that you know the portraits are the most kind of traditional work that I've made, you know, within a long time are your traditional kind of in-home documentary portraits. And people have, you know, questioned me about whether whether I might do something to them or or kind of edit them in a in a way that continues this sort of sculptural or or alternative process that I do in my work. And I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I'm I'm not sure if I'm gonna do that um or not, but I'm always open. I think I'm always open to to ideas and and thinking about things in a different way. I think that's the best way to be. It'll be a surprise to you. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. And so what remains is a project you started that got a little cut a little short due to all of the events of 2020. So 2020 kind of got me starting to sort of make make that work because I had been photographing these buildings in the Baltic countries. You know, every every kind of trip I made to Germany to document the refugee camps, I kind of made a 
quick pit stop in the in the Baltic countries, and then I'd be there and I'd, I'd document these buildings that were built during Soviet occupation. And so I built up a, a repository of, of these images, knowing that eventually someday I, I'd do something with them, but I don't know. I didn't know what. And, and then 2020 kind of hit and, and it gave everyone sort of a pause or, or a moment to kind of consider what they were doing, what they were making, life, kind of looking at archive of archives of our own. And so that's what I started doing. And that's when I, I started producing What Remains and kind of really taking a look at that work and, and figuring out how I wanted to tell that side of the story. And there's a laser cut aspect in those pieces as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that wouldn't, wouldn't have been possible without the series, you know, before that. And I had this idea, I don't know if it was while I was taking them or, you know, afterwards, just kind of looking at them when I processed the images, but I always had this sort of idea of combining them, these buildings, these very sort of dominant buildings with these traditional textile patterns from the, from the Baltic countries. And, you know, I didn't quite know how to do that. And of course, you know, after I made displacement and I got familiar with the laser cutter, like well laser cutting is one is one way that I can do that and then I started laser cutting in into those images and it worked to a way that I that I thought was really successful without showing the people it tells the story of of the people and their culture yeah so you see those patterns uh, quite often in like tablecloths of the of that region so Uh, And it's usually like the tablecloths that were meant for like a special event or a special occasion. You know, people were were using those kind of tablecloths for that. Uh, We see them in curtains sometimes as well, but um, mittens or like embroidered into scarves and things like that. You'll see see that as well. And they're old, old folk you know, patterns that have been passed down through through generations um, and continued to be passed down even during. Soviet occupation when um, kind of those traditions were being more suppressed at that time. The shapes within the textiles uh, and the signs and symbols really have a lot of references to the natural world. So they were all kind of part of these back in like pagan times. They're kind of part of kind of um, symbolizing the natural world, world, whether that was like the sun or lightning or... um, the river or water. Uh, and so that kept getting carried on um, as these sort of folk folk narratives. And then during occupation, you know, when these buildings were were being built. Um, so those are all, they're all Soviet architecture buildings, all very like stern, quickly built sort of concrete form. During that time period, kind of practicing those folk arts uh, was seen as an act of sort of political resistance. And so combining the two together, a little bit talks about that history in a, in a different way than than the than the refugee um, camp history, but it's related, absolutely for sure. And you received some grants recently. I received a number of grants to be able to produce the work from various institutions. I received a Center for Photographic Arts grant for that work, which is then now going to manifest itself in a three person show over there at the center starting in February, February of next year. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited about it. Great, great organization they have there. So, yeah. so if you don't pursue um, grants and opportunities, they, they typically don't just show up on, the, on your doorstep, do they? No, and that could be a full-time job too, um, pursuing all of that. So, but yes, like when when it's um, travel heavy work or research heavy work, um, that is just one really good way of kind of sustaining that kind of work. Here's, here's my really hard question. Oh. Do you have a favorite photo book ever? Oh, a, a favorite photo book ever. Um, I, have a, I have a couple favorites in my collection right now that came out recently. Andy Mattern came out with a, with a photo book. It might've been last year. And I really, you know, I, I've loved Andy's work for a really long time. And I, and I really love that photo book. It, it has a lot of his color work in it. That's really, really beautiful and, and graphic and interesting. And then another friend of mine whose work I, you know, I also adore Rodrigo Valenzuela. He also came out with a, with a photo book last year as well. And, and he's different side of the spectrum, very black and white. Uh, but also very graphic and and interesting 
historically based work as well. So uh, those are, those are my two top favorites, I think from the most recent years. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us tonight, Krista. It's so nice to have um, these two pieces here in the gallery now and the online exhibition up and thanks for taking the time to share some of the stories behind the work. Thank you so much for having me. It was really wonderful. Thanks for watching Photo Eye Conversations. I hope you enjoyed meeting Krista and hearing some of the stories that inspired the work. If you'd like to know a little bit more, you may email me at gallery at photoeye.com. And if you're going to be in Santa Fe, uh, stop by and look at the work. Thanks for watching and have a great night.